Once like a bird in prison, I dwell, no freedom from my soul I feel. But Jesus came and listened to me and glory to God. He set me free, he set me free, yes, he set me free.
Amen. Y'all are good followers. I told Miss Julianne, I said, y'all like how I held that quarter note out for seven counts. I, she said, she said Miss, Miss Cheryl said, we're good followers. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm glad we can hold to his unchanging hand. Let me make just a couple of announcements. Don't forget now, Wednesday nights, we'll pick back up with the buses and uh, get ready to go. In. We've had the basement tore apart for um, all about all summer. Hadn't really been able to do our children, but we're going to start back up on Wednesday night. We won't have any snacks or anything like that, but just have one main service over for the young people over in the uh, over in the building. Brother David, we plan on preaching that on Wednesday night, and um, and then uh, Bible study here at 7:30. I'll be here this week. I'll be here pretty much the rest of September. I'll be out next week uh, um, up in uh, North Carolina, but I've canceled about four four meetings so I could be around the house and. And be here and be with mom and dad to try to be around for them. So you pray for us these next weeks. Don't forget now, just it's just right around the corner. I know it's a little early, but just right around the corner. It's not but about five weeks of youth meeting. And I'm looking forward to that. God help us. And uh, so you be much in prayer about that. And uh, don't forget now, Wednesday night, 7.30, 7.30 Bible study. And then we'll uh, be a regular schedule next Sunday. The next Sunday is the fifth Sunday. And uh, we've, we've had our projects, just sort of us, no visitors tonight. And we need to raise, raise the money. We, I, I know the, the ceiling costs us about $6,100, and I believe we got the money in hand to pay that. And the carpet and the paint is going to be probably somewhere between eight and $9,000, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of that. And uh, we like to try to put some money as well on the principal of the note. So we need to be a blessing if we could. We normally take somewhere up on our fifth Sunday offering somewhere around Six to seven thousand dollars. The boy would be a real blessing if some of us pray and let God let us give a little extra this time. I know it's. I mean, I, listen. It's the end of the summer. Everybody's been on vacation. We're all broke, and I understand that. But uh, boy, would be a real blessing to just take care of those bills and get that taken care of. The basement looks tremendous, and uh, to God be the glory for that. And I, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't apologize for doing work at God's house. I mean, man, the, the house of God ought to be taken care of and well taken care of. And uh, I think it ought to be the nicest place in town, amen, cleanest place, neatest place. And uh, so I'm excited about how things look downstairs, and that's a real blessing. And uh, the carpet up here has done well, and we got, I got some things in mind next year. And uh, these, these pews need to be recovered. And, uh, and I think it would be a blessing maybe next year one of our projects will be to recover and put some new padding in them pews. Because the older I get, the longer I'm going to preach. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have more to say the older I get. Amen. <laughs> Somebody thinking, oh, heaven's the best. I'm just playing. I tell you what, y'all are, are lucky tonight after choir practice. I don't know if I'm going to have enough wind to preach. Amen. Don't say that. That's a number four night, brother. <laughs> Amen. Oh, me. But, I, but uh, pray about what the Lord have you do. I, and let's be a real blessing to receive these, a good offer next month, Sunday. And just pay all the bills be taken care of. And uh, I appreciate you giving. I thank the Lord for it. So don't forget about that regular Wednesday night, fifth Sunday next week. And don't forget in the Sunday school hour, everything you take up goes, and the fifth Sunday goes to the cemetery. And we're at the end of the cutting year. And uh, praise the Lord, we've had the Lord supply the needs to pay that. And uh, so we'll, we'll, everything you give during the Sunday school hour go toward the cemetery fund and all that's going right there. All right, don't forget we've got several sick folk. Continue to pray for Miss Eulene Couch. Miss Jean's fallen, been in and out of the hospital the last time, so let's pray. We're going to try to get by and see her this week, so let's continue to pray for her as she cares for Brother Jean. Also, I've got word since I've been home, Miss Clarinelle's not doing well. I need to pray for Miss Clarinelle Wilson. Also, I believe uh, Brother Sean shared with me this morning, maybe even Miss Lou might have had some many strokes, and, and uh, so we need to pray for her. Continue to pray for Brother Roger. He's battling. Uh, they're trying to get his thyroid and all regulated. So we need to pray God touch him. We love Brother Roger. We want him to feel good. We want him to feel better and strong. So let's pray God touch him. And always, Brother Albert, Miss Alma Jean, let's pray for them. God help them and touch them. Pray for the Wilson family. We got to get to know them. They're one of our missionaries who we spent some time with. Our precious family. And I uh, thank the Lord for our time with them. So let's pray for them. Remember these requests. And uh, I tell you what, let's put the bucket out. Brian, help me with the baker bucket. And uh, Nicholas, come help me, son. You give me a plate. Yeah, he got a plate. 
What about the Nicholson flavor in the back room back there? You see it right up here before you bring it up here, bro. Put it right here. I like it. Old Nicholas got saved on the front row. I like it. Praise God. Amen. Him and Daddy both. Amen. There's him one right there, right to give it to him. Amen. Old Christopher come up and asked me this morning, said, Preacher, when's you going to baptize me? Praise God. So we'll be, I hope maybe just in a couple of weeks we'll get that set up. Maybe. Um, I tell you what, Brother Dave, let's just plan on doing that. The first weekend's Labor Day weekend. That might be okay. Let's do it the second Sunday night in September. You ones that are being baptized, I'll give you time to invite your family. Second Sunday night in September, we'll baptize and get these kids baptized and folks baptized that need to be baptized. All right. All right, Miss Julianne's going to play. You come bring your faith promise mission offer to the front. Courtney, you come get ready to sing for our prayer. <laughs> Things. If you if you've sent me a message or you've tried to call me since Wednesday, and it wasn't if it was not late yesterday, you need to resend that text or resend that email, or because I haven't I finally got my phone situated yesterday. I donated a phone on Monday to the Italian taxi service. It's a real blessing, amen, and. Uh, I just about, it was bad, I just about donated, or Chris Simpson just about donated Miss Amy's camera to the Italian taxi service. I came in and left my phone and I walked in and I, I was going to do something. I showed the, pic, the picture of the address to the cab driver and I don't know what I did with my phone after that. And uh, so we looked for it, we got ready and I just, I thought I'm not even going to take my backpack, I'm just going to take my camera. And we got in this there was a whole bunch of us got in this little bitty car and I was in the middle and the sides and part of the front seat too. And I told Chris Simpson to hold Miss Amy's phone, um, hold Miss Amy's camera. And we got out at the next stop and I thought, man, I set that camera down. And I turned around and the cab was gone. But I thank God it wasn't me. It was Chris Simpson that left Miss Amy's camera on that taxi. But finally, the Lord, we paid, paid, we got it, and he brought it back and all this sort of thing. Brother Mike looked at me. He said, Preacher, he said, I sure am glad they brought, we found that camera. He said, otherwise, me and you would have been missionaries in Albania because we weren't going home to tell Miss Amy we lost her camera. <laughs> he said, I, we would have felt the Macedonian call again. Amen. So, uh, but if you have called me or sent me a message in the last few days, I haven't got it, but I do as of today. It was actually pretty pleasant not having a cell phone for four days. But uh, if you sent me a message or you know somebody that has, tell them to resend it because I finally got my phone up. So if you need me, you can call me in the days to come. All right, Miss Courtney, you sing for us. <laughs>
told Brother Matt before she sang, I felt like I should have been in bed three hours ago, amen. But I'm feeling better now, amen. First Corinthians chapter number four. First Corinthians in chapter number four. Appreciate Dr. Carper being here last week. And I know, I don't know if he's still doing it, for, but for about a year, Brother Matt, and I, and I know some others listen to TBI on occasion, but for about a year, Dr. Carper had been preaching about the Muslims on his radio program and explaining the difference and all that's involved in Islam and such as that. And I don't know, have you heard it lately, Brother Matt? It, he's done a long time on if you you ever want to do a little study on that I'm sure Dr. WTBI has got the WTBI has got those tapes but uh, I, I have caught some of those and he really did a, a good job expounding on that probably on his website the bright spot hour you can look that up but uh, he's a he's a great preacher and I thank the Lord for it all right first Corinthians chapter number four we're gonna read four verses or five verses then I'll share with you my thought this evening. Let's stand together, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And I'll say this, the first, that Corinthian church that Paul's writing to, 1 Corinthians, was the most worldly church of the New Testament. And I'm sure you've heard me say before, if I was going to name a church Corinth Baptist Church today, I'd at least name it 2nd Corinth Baptist Church. Amen. I wouldn't want to identify with that crowd that was in 1 Corinthians 4. But I'll be honest with you, we very much identify in our day with what's going on in this Corinthian church. The Bible said in verse number 9, For I think that God has set for us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. You can be seated. I want to preach tonight for a little while on this thought. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? May I say to you, that word was not used lightly in the word of God. It was not just thrown around in the scriptures like it is today. But I'll be honest with you, today it's just thrown around as, a, as another term. And we just use it so lightly. And I'm afraid that just as it was in, the, in this church at Corinth, I'm afraid there's a lot of folks that are confused in our modern days of what it really means to be a Christian. What it really means, I hear people say carnal Christian. Let me say there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. You may be a carnal saved person, but you'll never be a carnal Christian. That word Christian, it means, it embodies the meaning Christ-like. And you can't be worldly and Christ-like at the same time. But I'm afraid that there's a lot of folks as it was in the Corinthian church. They thought they were great Christians. But in our text, Paul begins to show them where they are and begins to rebuke. I'm trying to study. You help me pray. I'm trying to study. And I'm wanting to preach out of the next few weeks. I want to preach out of the churches of Revelation 2 and Revelation chapter number 3. And I want to preach for a few weeks on this thought. Let's go to church. And I'm going to get to that in the coming weeks, I hope. But in every one of those churches, God reveals something about himself. And then he reveals something about those churches. And I believe everything you find in those churches that are found present in our day today, I believe every, every characteristic that's in those seven churches, 
of uh, those churches, Brother Lima, I didn't realize we were talking, and I, I didn't realize this until last week as we were talking about the Word of God. Those churches are all within a 35-mile radius together uh, there in that place. But may I say to you, I think a lot of those, those churches in Revelation 7 were a little bit, uh, Revelation 2 and 3, were a little bit confused on where they were and how they really measured up. And may I say to you, I think there's more than just a few. May I say most of us are really, con- I, I, I don't think understand the gravity of what it is to be called a Christian in this day. Amen. The difference between a saved person and a Christian. And I think the reality, we need to understand the reality of our Christian heritage is that many of our forefathers that went before us sealed their testimony by paying the ultimate cost. They sealed their faith with their blood. Many church leaders died as a martyr for their Christian faith. And probably, I may I say to those Jackson and, and, and Cooper and Brother Ben and Brother Kobe, probably the thing that stirred me the most while we were gone is when we were standing in the very places where the people of God in ages gone by spilled their blood for what they believed. We stood in the town of Duress, Albania, Duress, Albania, the first place we stopped like this, and we walked into a coliseum that had been halfway unearthed. They had found it sometime, and that would have been the place that, that history says that Titus would have been a martyred for the cause of Christ. He sent him over there to those barbarians according to the word of God. And uh, Brother David, he lost his life and we stood in the very middle of that Colosseum and looked around and uh, I thought, man, I'd like to shout because of, uh, I mean, I wanted to lift my hands and praise God for the testimony of Titus and how he shed his blood on those very grounds. And I could, he, and I could think about the people that stood in those uh, in those rocky chairs or those, those uh, uh, seats around that small coliseum and listen uh, to me, hear the jeers in my head but can I tell you, as much as I wanted to stand up and rejoice uh, and give God the glory for the testimony of such a Christian as Titus, it made me want to get on my face uh, and repent to the shallow Christianity or that we live in our modern day. Uh, I wanted to get down and ask God to forgive me for what I believe uh, and man I'm trying to do my best but I don't think it measures up uh, to that kind of Christianity uh, where they seal their faith with their life and their blood I thought about as we walked up that Roman road we walked off into that old old town the old Rome that would have been there before before the days of Christ we walked through there and walked down that little rocky place and we sat down or we walked and looked over to that stone. It was almost like a stone cave. And I wanted to rejoice that there in that little place that the, word, that the very word of God that we read today was pinned down. The book of 2 Timothy was pinned in that Mamatine prison. As we walked down that cobblestone road, that large cobblestone road that would have been known as the Roman road, I wanted to give God the glory that I was walking the footsteps where the Apostle Paul had trod. Man, when we went to Israel, I I wanted to shout the victory that I could have been walking. I mean, I remember walking into the Garden of Gethsemane, and I remember touching one of them olive trees, and I wondered, I wondered maybe as he walked through there that he lay his hand on that tree. And I remember the glory that I, I mean, man, I thought the Apostle Paul the greatest Christian, the greatest preacher since of the Lord Jesus himself. And as we walked down that Roman road, I thought, man, I want to give God the glory. But then I thought again, as I did in that Colosseum in the rest, I thought, my goodness, uh, how weak we are. We bellyache and complain uh, oh, because our feelings get hurt. And man, we get somebody gets crossways with us or we complain about things that have no eternal bearing. And I thought, dear God, I need to get down on my face on this cobblestone road uh, and ask God to forgive me for my shell of commitment in my Christian life. But I would say the things that moved me the most on our trip was when I stood in those places, Brother David, where the martyrs had shed their blood. They said in an old market area in Edinburgh, Scotland, there's a monument standing at the spot where thousands of believers were hung. 
and burned at the stake. And they said just a few hundred feet away from that, on the grounds of Greyfriar Kirk, is another marker erected in honor of the thousands who died for their faith in Scotland. There's a place not far from Pompeii, Italy, where thousands of Christians were fed to the lions and martyrs as a sporting event to the soldiers. It's said that more Christians died in that place than any other place than they ever had died. And I tell you, as I stood in those places, the, the reality, it brought home to me the reality of the faith that I now enjoy and what great a price it was purchased of, not only by Christ, by people that went others. Tell me, tell me how many Christians you really think you know that with a doubt in your mind, without a doubt in your mind, they'd go to the stake before they compromise the Bible. Huh? Those places are overwhelming. We stood in that great Colosseum. That Colosseum was beginning to be built in, 19, in, in 75 AD, AD, completed somewhere around 90, a little 90 to 95 AD. And Paul would have been some of the first to lose their life in that Colosseum. Something I learned about that Colosseum while we were there, Brother Gerald, I didn't know. But when it was first built, they could flood the Colosseum and have naval battles in it. And what they thought was sport, what they thought was a game, they marched the man of God in there, cut his head off for preaching that Bible. Are you listening? I, I, I mean, I'm talking about what, it, what does it really mean to be a Christian. What does it really mean? I think of the apostles. Tradition tells us that Andrew was crucified on, a, on an X-shaped cross. They said they threw James from the pinnacle of the temple and they found him alive. And when they found him alive, they beat him with clubs till he died. Peter was crucified upside down. Philip was severely whipped and scourged and then hanged by a neck against a pillar. Thomas was martyred by a lance being thrust through his body while he was praying. And then they cut the apostle Paul's head off. You still want to be a Christian? Amen. I mean, man, this modern day feel good. Joel Osteen self-propped up. Amen. Christianity. But man, I'll tell you something. Our ranks are none the better. I mean, it takes 25 people, one young and sick, and their family and their first cousins have got to come home and stay home out of the house of God to take care of one child. Amen. I'm afraid it ain't going to be a number four, Brother Sean. Amen. I mean, God help us. People quit and move churches because somebody looked at them crossways. Or they moved the piano from one side of the platform to the other. Or they changed the lights or their plaque fell off the end of the pew. Man, I'm talking about real Christianity where people walked down the road and all they would have had to do was recant their faith and they would have lived. I remember they said they cut in the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, they were, the one man was proclaiming the word of God and they cut his arm off because he wouldn't stop. And they said they took his bloody, bloody limb that was left and beat his chest while they burned him to death. I'm talking about genuine Christianity. Amen. I think it's interesting that as you look at the text in verse 9, look at what he said. Paul said, I think that God has set us for us, the apostles last, as it were that we appointed to death. I believe the apostle Paul and the apostles realized that their faith was probably, probably brought on them a death sentence for what they believed. And I tell you something, in their day and time, it wasn't popular to be a Christian. They didn't just get made fun of in the market or they didn't just get made fun of on the news and they just didn't get mocked and made fun of. I mean, I, I think I was with Brother, Brother Wilson in that little town of Mercy. We, I think we ran up on a Greek Orthodox and we ran up on somebody and he wanted to mock a little bit. We told him we were Baptist preachers. and He wanted to mock a little bit and I couldn't understand all that he was saying but he would, he'd say a little something and poke his buddy and they'd laugh. Amen. I mean, preachers leave churches because somebody gets to where they don't like them a little bit. 
But we're supposed to believe that we're going to steal our testimony and our blood and we can't even get past somebody not liking us. I mean, we come to church and we can't worship the God of heaven that's redeemed us and purchased us with his blood but because somebody said something cross to me. Somebody tell me, is there a real Christian left? I mean, I felt, I'll be honest with you, Brother David, I felt about like that as I walked down that road. I thought, dear God, I don't measure up. I don't measure up. Amen, Brother Kobe. That's how I felt. I mean, man, I, 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 the seeing the people that needed God, seeing that man in the Vatican move me, but nothing moved us while we were, moved me while we were gone, like being in those places where those people seal, their, seal what they believe with their blood. Amen. Everybody okay? Hey, I know this is the best we got. It's Sunday night and, the, the, you know, the Sunday morning crowd's gone. I understand that. But I wonder how many of us think we've really arrived and we ain't nowhere in the vicinity of arriving. Some of us think because we took a pair of britches off and hung our britches up or hit them somewhere in the closet and got a dress out and got a good haircut, we don't curse anymore. That's all there is to being a Christian. Amen. And believe me, I believe in living clean. Amen. There's more to being a child of God than that. Amen. Amen. I'll be honest with you. God, help us in this day. Because it, it, it wouldn't take very much at all till some of us may have to seal what we believe with our blood. I'll be honest with you. If that, if that Muslim in that little town, if he had had a knife, if he could have killed us, he would have cut our throats before he would have thought twice. Amen. But thank God, hallelujah. I don't believe in a statue of God. I don't plan to, I'm planning to a God that can restrain a man to where he can't put his hands on a child of God. Hey, friend, I thank God that this Christian life is real. What it takes to be a, what does it mean to be a real Christian? The Apostle Paul begins to look at the church at Corinth. These Corinthian believers, they thought they had arrived and they considered themselves wise and they thought Paul was a fool. The Corinthian believers believed themselves strong and they were weak. Paul was weak. And it, it's obvious in our text that there was a great divide in what they thought was a Christian and what Paul thought was a Christian. And I'll be honest with you, and I believe in our modern day churches, there's a great divide on what we think is a Christian and what really is a child of God. Amen. Amen. I'm not belittling our burdens because I understand we all have burdens. But we sure do sometimes want to quit and have a bad attitude and a bad spirit over stuff that absolutely doesn't matter. Amen. Amen. Our problem is we get our eyes on one another when our eyes ought to be on the Lord. It's hard to get a bad spirit with your eyes on God. Amen. It's hard to get a critical attitude when you're looking at the Lord. Because when you're really looking at Him, you really see, you really feel how inadequate we are. How small I am. How insignificant I am when I've got my eyes where it ought to be. But when I begin to compare, I never do find somebody better than me to compare myself to. You know as well as I do, you pick out somebody that think you, you think you're more spiritual, that you live cleaner, you've got more convictions, you do this and they don't, and that's who you want to compare yourself to. And because you measure up in that little statue, you think, man, I'm a Christian. Mm. Everybody all right? Now, I know the circumstances are different in our day, a little bit different right now. But I believe what Paul said about being a Christian proves true today. Three things that I'm done. Number one, look at your Bible. Look at verse number nine. For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles last, as it were appointed unto death, for we are made a spectacle. Let me just, hold up. Let me just say this right here. Somebody think, preacher, what would you do if somebody would talk about you, say about you what they said about me? <laughs> Hello? Do you think everybody loves me? I could take you to five preachers right now that won't shake my hand. That don't even know me. 
Amen. One of our church members works with some folks that don't like me. They said, man, they just started criticizing one day. One of our men said, what, what's his middle name? They said, well, we don't know. They said, so you don't know him. Amen. Let me tell you something. Words hurt. Yes. But words are no reason to quit. Amen. Amen. I mean, God help us, man. If we were looking to, listen, we, we need to quit looking to get out and looking for reasons to stay here. Amen. Sure, you said, does it not hurt? Sure it hurts. But can I tell you this? It ain't the ones out, hurt, out there that say things that hurt you. It's the ones that are in here. Hello? When you don't understand, when you don't give me the benefit of the doubt, that's the ones I stay up with. Those folks that I don't know, and can I just be honest with you, probably don't care to know. Amen. They don't bother me. Everybody okay? Let's just take, let's take our suit coats off and let's get down to where the rubber meets the road tonight. Amen. You say, what, what would you do if somebody speak? You get up in the morning, you put your britches on, you put your suit on, you put your tie on, and you go after it again because the God of heaven is worth our faithfulness. He's worth me having a good spirit. What if I walk out of the house with a bad spirit and the first person I come to is a lost person that needs God and they see me in a foul spirit? You think they want to get saved? No. Amen. You say lives dealt me a blood bro. Grunt, listen, join the crowd. People said, "Well, I wish I was brother Mark. I'd have a new truck. I'd have this. I'd have that. Yeah, and you'd have a mother's got Alzheimer's too. Try them shoes on. You'd have a mother-in-law that can't talk." It's got a rare form of Parkinson's that can't even write, you can't speak. Ride that truck a while. Hey man, everybody okay? Everybody wants to, everybody wants to look and they you, and look, see you want we as Christians, we'll look over there and we'll we'll judge what we can see. But the problem is you can't see what's behind the curtain. Hey man, you look at that person down the aisle and say, boy, man, I, 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 man, I, they ought to be better than that. Yeah, but you don't know what they're living with at home. Hey, man, everybody all right? I mean, man, I, hey, man. Hey, man. A lot of young preachers look and say, boy, I, I'd like to have that. I'd like to get to preach out every week. I can't even get, hey, I'll call my preacher friends, pastor friends. I can't even get them to ride with me. I've had one, I've had one say, he, he said, Brother Mark, how, how can I get out and start preaching on the road? How can I get out and do this? And I can't even get him to ride to a meeting with me one night out of a week. Am I wrong? He said, man, I want to preach some meetings. How do I do that? Like I, I've got, I don't have a formula for that. I didn't write the formula. God started ringing the phone. I want to go, I want to go. Do you really? Man told Brother Mark, I want to pick a guitar like you. And I remember, he, I'll never forget what he told him. He said, how, do you really? He said, how many guitars you want a hole in because you want to practice that long? Everybody all right? I'm telling you what it takes. What, what does it mean to be a Christian in our day? What, I tell you, it means the same thing it did in that day. Amen. We ought to reach down and get your bootstraps and pull them up. I saw something in Europe that I must, I'm, I'm tore up about. All you Carhartt boys, they make Carhartt skinny jeans in Europe. It's a God-forsaken abomination. I used to be for Carhartts, but Carhartt compromised and made a pair of stinking skinny jeans. God help us. Hey Amen. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but it just hit me just right there. I don't have any idea I lost my train of thought right there. God help us. How wrong it was. Amen. I'm going to get some things. Amen. 
What does it mean to be a Christian? What I thought, I know. Don't put you no skinny jeans. Put your big boy britches on. Amen. I don't wear them knickers anymore. Miss Amy used to like them smocking, those little outfits on the boys that had them smocking on them. And they're cute as a button. And they wear them little, them little outfits that had them little knicker britches. Let me just say, they don't make knickers for many kilograms. <laughs> Brother Dean come to the house one time. He's going to swim. I was going to let him and, him, and, him and Preston go swimming with the boys. And he put a pair of my long basketball shorts to wear to bed around the house, put them on. He <laughs> looked like he had a pair of culottes on. It went halfway down his knee. He said, I know what it means to wear culottes now. Amen. But you know what most of us need to do in our Christian life? We need to lay our petty things down. I tell you, when your back's broke, Brother Richard, petty things don't mean, flick, don't mean a lick, does it, Miss Millis? Kind of puts things into perspective. Amen. Amen. And can I be honest with you? Most of the things we stay tore up about in our Christian life are petty. Amen. Petty. Most of the things that steal our joy are not great storms. Brother Roger, let me say publicly to you, I appreciate how you face what you've gone through. I've not heard you complain. I've not heard him complain. Let's just be honest, it's been over eight months since he felt good. Am I, am I right, Miss Pat? Would you agree with me? It's been over eight months since he felt good, but I've not heard him complain. Are you listening? I want to be a real Christian. Qu quickly, I've got to hurry. I've been preaching a long time and I didn't get started. What is being? Look what the Bible said in verse 9. He said, For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. That word spectacle was used as a describe what was known as a Roman triumph. Y'all boys, you remember when we walked, we walked through that large gate when we walked into the old town of Rome. That's where the Roman generals would have rode their horses after they'd gone and won a battle. And what they would have done, they'd have rode through there and they'd had all their generals and soldiers, but in tow, Brother David, there would have been all the prisoners of war in shackles and chains, and they would have led them down that Roman road and mocked them while they ran down there, while they walked down through there. That's a spectacle. That's what comes in that word. That word carries an ideal of being a public spectacle. It's the word we get our word theater from, which means a public viewing. And Paul was telling the Christians at Corinth that this thing of the Christian life is a public matter. Can I say first of all what it means to be a Christian the Christian life is observed by the world. It's observed by the world. Notice verse 9. Look at your Bible. For I think that God has set for us the apostles last, and it was were appointed unto death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. Can I say, first of all, there's a human observation. We're being watched by those around us. Whether you realize it or not, we're being watched by those around us. When we come in contact with it at the grocery store and our family and our, and our family reunions, wherever we go, people, they're observing our Christians. People, you ask people, say, are you saved? They say, well, that's a private matter. And I understand what they're saying about it. It's a pri it is a, a personal matter. It's a per but listen, we, may, we got to never forget that our Christian life, this walk that God's put us in, it is not just a private matter. It's a public matter. It's a public matter. And people around us, they watch how we live. They listen to the way we talk. They observe how we act and how we react. When you profess to be a Christian, whether you like it or not, you become a spectacle to the world. And you better believe this, you live in a glass house. And you preachers, listen to me. I'm going to be as honest with you as I can. The downside of the ministry is that you live in a fishbowl and everybody can see and the problem is, they're going to judge your family in ways they won't even judge their, their own family. 
I'm not down on the ministry. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Listen, I'm not complaining, but that's the reality in which we live. Amen. Amen. It's a public matter. And I'll say again, fellas, you better be careful because you'll do more damage outside of here to your ministry than you'll ever do in here. Amen. It's a, it's a, it's a Christian life is observed. They said there was a, a church member thought he was a great Christian and they asked him to go to a Sunday school to the junior department and give a talk to the juniors about what it meant to be a Christian. He went in there and he, he looked, he's proud. They'd ask him to come down to the juniors and he looked in there and said, hey, why do y'all think they call me a Christian? This little boy raised his hand. He said, yes, sir, son. He said, because they don't know you. <laughs> mm. I'm about letting your air out. But can I tell you, the sad truth is that a lot of folks who call themselves Christian are not known by that around them. They live hurtful lives that hinder people around them to be called a child of God. This is what, let me tell you what some folks said. Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. He was a young man that was looking for answers and lived for a short time when he was trying to figure out his way. He lived with a, with a Christian couple. This is what he said later in his life. He said, I'd be a Christian if it weren't for other Christians. Robert Ingersoll, the infidel of England, and he's well known for his attacks against the Bible. He had a godly aunt. And he wrote a book that attacked the Bible. He sent her a book, one of his books, and this is what he wrote in the leaflet of the, the leaf of the fly leaf of the book that he sent her. He said, if all Christians had lived like Aunt Sarah, perhaps this book would have never been written. And we better realize what people see in our life is the image they form of our God. How you work at your workplace reflects the kind of God we serve. Amen. Amen. If you work, you ought to give it the very dead level best you got. I mean, you ought to give it the, the dead. I mean, man, you go to the job and work. Ladies, if you keep house, whatever it is. Men, if you drive a truck, if whatever it is you do, you work. Your work, your character is a reflection of the God we serve. Amen. Amen. Spurgeon used to go to Monaco. He'd spend Monaco. He'd go to Monaco and spend time for his health. He didn't go there to gamble, but he went there because of the beautiful gardens. He went to a, a place that was a casino, but he didn't gamble. He had walked through the gardens. And he said he thought the gardens were some of the most beautiful in the world, but he said he talked to one of his friends one day who went to that same place in Monte Carlo. And the owner of that casino had said to Spurgeon, and said, you hardly visit my gardens anymore. Spurgeon's friend replied, he said, well, he said, I don't gamble. He said, it wouldn't be fair for me to continue to enjoy these gardens and not contribute to the casino who keeps them up. And that casino owner looked at Spurgeon's friend. He said, why don't you just keep coming? He said, he said man, he said, if you quit coming, I'm going to lose customers. And he said, if you quit visiting these gardens, he said, there's many people who don't gamble in the casino who feel quite comfortable in the gardens. He said, but then from the gardens, it's just a short walk to the gambling table. He said, you see, when you visit my gardens, respectable people, that, uh, respectable people like you, you attract others who eventually become my gambling customers. Spurgeon said when he heard that statement, he never went back to the gardens again. William Carey, the father of modern missions was brought to Christ because of an influence of a person that was with him, worked with him. This is what Carey said about his friend. He said, my friend couldn't answer my questions, but I couldn't answer his life. In other words, he didn't have all the doctrine figured out. He couldn't answer all my questions about God. He couldn't answer all my questions about the Bible. He said he didn't have the answers for my questions, but I didn't have an answer for his life. Are you listening? There's a, there's a human observation when it comes to being a Christian. Look at verse 9. 
He said we're made a spectacle unto the world and to angels. Not only is there a human observation, there's a heavenly observation. He said we're observed by angels. You better believe we, the Bible said we're encamped by angels. We're encamped around. And we live in a time where it's easy to fall and it's easy to fail. And I think God put some angels in our life as resources to keep us from falling. Amen. John Patton, a missionary in the New Hebrides Islands, the hostiles, I mean, it was terrible, terrible times. The natives were going to burn them out and kill them. And they said they came to the house, and John Patton and his wife were inside the house praying for God's protection. And for some reason, they didn't attack. And about a year later, the chief came to see John Patton. And Patton asked him, he said, why, why didn't you attack, attack us a year ago? And the chief asked John Patton, he said, who were all those men that were with you? Patton said, sir, it was only me and my wife. And the chief insisted. He said, there were hundreds of men around your shack in bright shining clothes holding drawn swords and standing in a circle around the mission station. You say, I've heard that before. Praise God. I'm glad it didn't just happen once. Hey, man, glory to God. Hey, listen, there's not only a human observation, but according to the word of God, we've been a spectacle unto angels and God's put them in our life to keep us from falling. Christian life is to be observed by the world. Number two, and I'm hurrying. The Christian life is to be opposite of the world. Look at verse 11. The Bible says, even to this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it. Vance Havner said the church has become so worldly, the world so churchy, you can't tell them apart. Amen. Everybody wants to talk about contemporary. You say, why don't you like contemporary music? It mimics the world. It mimics the world. That ought to be enough. If I wanted to mimic the world, I'd have stayed lost because the world's better than it being the world than the church is. Amen. Amen, friend. It ought to be opposite the world. When you talk about being a Christian, you talk about living a life that's opposite of the world. When the Bible speaks of the world, it's talking about that system that's going in the opposite direction of God. Notice what verse 11, we see the conditions of Paul's life. He said, we hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. That's where he was living. And Paul was describing, he said, it's not been easy for us to be a Christian. There's many hardships. It's brought on much suffering. It's a whole lot different than the Christianity we hear preached today. You say, why aren't people having hardship? Why, why are some of these people, could it be they're not, they're not going in an opposite direction. It's hard to swim upstream, friend. It's hard to swim upstream. You say, why? Why is everybody having it so good? Man, I'm battling this. Hey, that's the life that the Word of God said is a real Christian. We suffer, we're naked, we're hungry. We see the conditions of his life. Notice verse 12. I want you to notice the conduct of his life. Now here's where, we, here's where we all can learn, including me. The Bible said labor working with our own hands. Listen to me. Here we go. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. Not only did he talk about the conditions of how he was living, he talked about the conduct of how he was living. He talked about how he reacted to the mistreatment of others. The word revile means to speak evil against. How does the world respond to being spoke, spoke evil against? Well, in our day, they sue you. And fellas, let me tell you something. You might as well buckle her down. If you're going to have any kind of public ministry, there's going to be things said about you that are not true. But you can't spend your ministry running around chasing down every comment that's made that's not right. You can't spend your ministry 
running over here to this church and that church where somebody said something and somebody said something. And, hey, God didn't call us to defend ourselves. He'll defend us. And I'll be honest with you, that's hard. That's hard. There's times that, that things have been said that have put me in a negative light in the ministry and, and it had nothing to do but they were trying to prop somebody else up and trying to promote somebody else and they had to tear me. And listen, I don't, amen. And I mean, I've done my best to stay clean and try to keep good character and have a good name. That Bible said a good, good name's better than riches. And I wanted to go over there. I'll be honest with you, I wanted to go hand. Somebody said, don't lay hands on any man suddenly. I wasn't planning on doing it suddenly. I was planning on doing it often. Amen. And I'm not, hey, Brother Kobe, I don't, I don't want to preach as though I've arrived because I always can't do it. I get upset still about certain things. But Paul said, when I'm, we're reviled, we bless. You know what rings in my ears, Brother Howard? It's not the message from a preacher. It's the message from a soft-spoken mother. She used to say, son, you're just going to have to kill them with kindness. I mean, I, Brother Lyman, if I had a nickel for every time my mother told me that, son, you're just going to have to kill them with kindness. Just be kind. Just be kind. Just be kind. What are they going to do? Criticize you for being too nice? Huh? Amen. My flesh wants to defend myself. My flesh wants to come up and light into them. But the, Paul said, we will revile, we bless. Some of us have tried to get even. Some of us have tried to talk about the one who's talked about us. Why don't we just try being nice? You say, well, it didn't work the first time. Try again. You said it didn't work the second time. Try again. He said when we're reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer. That word bless speaks of we deliver a eulogy. We speak good about it. One preacher said when a person dies, it amazes me. You, go to, you can go to people's funeral being wicked as a devil and you think they got... You think they're about to start another Red Cross. They're a saint. One preacher man died in his church. A man died that he knew he was a thief. He was a liar. Scoundrel. Crook. And the preacher said he wasn't sure how he was going to preach this man's funeral and not tell the truth. He said his brother said the man's brother offered him $500 if he'd preach his funeral. The only condition was the preacher had to say that the man was a good man. He didn't know how he was going to do that. So he got up there and he got to preach and he said, he looked at the, he got there preaching and preaching that man's funeral. He looked down there in the cast and he said, all of us know that man was a liar. He was a cheat and he was a crook and he was a scoundrel. But next to his brother, he's a good man. <laughs> got his $500, amen. There's probably people that wouldn't walk across the street to put, put me out if I was on fire. But what Paul said was, he said, when we're reviled, we ought to bless them. Can I tell you something right there? And help me now, and I struggle. I'm not good at that. But can I tell you what Paul said that was? Paul said that's what being a Christian was. I don't know about you. Maybe you've got, you know, maybe you walk on the streets of gold. You don't have, you don't have fallen flesh, but I do, and I struggle right there. Amen. He said, we see the conduct of his life. The conduct. He was a Christian. He wasn't of this world. And our action and reaction of a Christian ought to be opposite of that which the world is. And as a Christian, your behavior is a reflection of the Lord Jesus. Christian is, a Christian life is to be observed of the world. A Christian life is to be opposite of the world. Now look at your Bible. Look at verse 13. I'm done. Come on, Miss Julian. It'll make them feel better. I'm going to let you play. I shouldn't have let Miss Courtney sing. She got to making me feel better. Notice what the Bible said in verse 13. I'm done. It said, We're made as filth of the world of the offscuring of all things unto this day. That word filth and offscuring there is a synonym which refers to the scrapings or what's left in a dirty dish or a pot. He said, that's what we are to the world. 
Can I tell you something? The Christian life is not only to be observed by the world. It's not only to be, it's not only to be opposite of the world. But can I tell you this? A Christian life is really offensive to the world. If we're going to be a real Christian in the world, hey, listen to me. It should be no surprise to us. Listen to me. There never has been, there's not now, and there never will be a love affair between the world and a Christian. Never. We, we think it's hard today. We think we're living in hard times. For we, Man. What would, what would it have been if we'd have been living in 55 and 60, 65 and 70, and 75 and 80 AD where Christians were killed for what they believed? And I'll just be honest with you, America is one of the only places today that Christians aren't being killed for what they believe. And let's just be honest, Baptist folk were getting killed by the Catholics. They are getting killed from both sides. We've even been hated worse than that. Amen. The Catholics were killing us and the Reformers were killing us. Amen. A real Christian's life is going to be offensive. Our morals are offensive. It's amazing to me that we're the bad guy, but people who are doing that which is unnatural are accepted. Less than 10% probably of Americans are living an alternative lifestyle. And nothing can be said to them, but you let a Christian stand up for what they believe, and it offends the whole world. Why? Because our morals are offensive to the world. You know what bothers this world? What bothers the world is our message. We say there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way. Our morals, the way we live. It was amazing. Brother David, at camp, we took our young ladies. You know, they never did say anything about the boys. We took the boys the first day. They played in their, they played in their long pants. But we took them 250 girls over there and let them play volleyball and softball and basketball. And they wore their culottes. And some of them wore skirts. And Before we left, the lady at the, at the, Parking Rec Center over here looked at me. She said, can I ask you a question without offending you? She said, why? Why do all the girls got skirts on? Or those long. I said, ma'am, we feel like it just makes them look more like a lady. She said, okay. Just wonder. People notice. You can ask Papa Bear. He drives the buses. And he could tell you on multiple occasions when we've gone out in the group and we look, we look right. He's had people come up to the bus and say, I just want you to know we appreciate the way your group looked. He said, you really did look like a church group. Acted like a church group. Amen. Brother Rudy's folks were going from, they were going to Brother Dean's preacher boy meeting and stopped at Cracker Barrel and got off the church bus. And the lady, later, the lady later, later told him in the Cracker Barrel in Commerce, she said, we normally despise seeing church groups pull up in our parking lot. She said, but I just want to thank you for how you and your group looked and act. She said, y'all really acted like a church group. When our buses pull up somewhere, I don't want them to cringe because we get out. Are you listening? I want them to see I want us to be right, look right, act right, talk right. Amen. 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 Our morals are offensive in the world. But most of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the gospel is to them that perish foolishness. They hate our message. Because if our message is right, they're a sinner. And the only person that can change that is Jesus. See, we're living in a day where man has exalted their self as being a little God. But if our message is right, they're lost and need a help. Can I tell you something, folks? It really ought to mean something when we say they're a Christian. And I, and I say to you, listen to me, 
Everybody look up here preaching. I'm not preaching as though I've arrived. I'm a work in process. I'm a work in progress. But I don't want somebody to write of me like what Muhammad, Muhammad Magandhi said. I'd be a Christian if it weren't for other Christians. I'd want to live a life that my boys, if they ever did go, to, if said if, they said if everybody was like my mom and daddy, I'd have never went this way. Can I tell you this right here? Everybody listen to me. I don't want to be some sinner's excuse for going to hell. Straight up. I don't want some sinner to look at me at the great white throne judgment and said, I would have went to heaven. I'd have got saved if he had really been what he said he was. You say, well, preacher, they mistreated him. Let me ask you something. What about that person? If they've spoke bad of you and maybe they're backbiting you or maybe they're giving you a hard time at work and you return to them what they've given you, what if they're doing that because they're lost and you act just like them? How do you think that's going to do? What kind of impact? You say, well, they say they're saved, preacher. Yeah, there's a lot of people that say they're saved that ain't. We can't know that. That doesn't mean what they say don't hurt. I, I wish, I wish that I could tell you I've arrived at the place where I hear some, what somebody says about me that I can just go on and I never give it a second thought. I'm not there yet. Y'all pray for me, but I'm not there yet. But I think my wife that knows me as intimately, more intimate than my own parents would stand up and testify that there's a whole lot less that doesn't bother me that does bother me. But I'm not there yet. I wish I could say somebody could look at me and say what they wanted to and my flesh wouldn't rise up. I had a preacher call me this summer that didn't like something about somebody that I was preaching and that I, we were using in one of our meetings and just absolutely ripped me up one side and down the other. I've never seen this man. He's never seen me. He doesn't even know me. But he didn't like something about one of our meetings. And I'll be honest with you, but I believe the Lord let that phone call happen just to show me how strong my flesh really was. Because that man literally threatened me on the telephone. And before I knew it, the hair was standing up on my arms. And it was a, it was a good thing it was a telephone call. Because I'm just going to be honest with you. And y'all pray for me, I'm just honest. I, I, don't, I don't put no clothes on, I'm just real with you about what I am. I'm not trying to play no games. I'm not proud of what I'm telling you. I'm just telling you, Lord, let me see really how strong my flesh still really was. Had that man been in front of me, I couldn't tell you that I could have, I could have contained myself. I was that angry. And it wasn't righteous indignation. It may have started as righteous indignation, but it took an exit, and I went straight to the flesh. But you know what I found out what God reminded me of? It's just how strong my flesh really was. And I sat down on my boy's basketball court and I squalled because of the way I reacted. And I didn't even know who the man was. And I pushed Reed out on my telephone. And I said, sir, I didn't appreciate what you said. And I think you were out of line. I said, but I was wrong. And I'm sorry for how I reacted. And I said, what you said gives me no right to react like I did. I didn't curse him. I didn't say ugly words to him. But I was angry. 
I mean, I'm talking about red hot anger, unbridled anger. And I was under conviction about what I felt, not what I said. And you know, I just be honest with you, I had to swallow a lot of pride to say I saw. But it didn't take but just a minute for God to let me see just how alive my flesh really was. Everybody all right? Y'all pray for me. All I know is to be honest with you. There's one thing, look at here. There may be one thing people may accuse me of, but I'm not one to hide. What you see is what you get. Brother Mark, the brother Mark you see is the brother Mark you get. And I went in and told Amy, I said, I told her what happened. And I said, I was wrong for the way I felt. I didn't even say bad things. I didn't even get ugly with it. But I was wrong for what the rage that was in me. Brother Mays preached a message many years ago said, can anybody find me a real Christian? I want my family, the people that know and love me the best. I mess up around my family. I'm not perfect, Brother Ron. Y'all know that. I'm not perfect. But I want to be real. And if my family needs, needs somebody that thinks a Christian, I, I want to be one of the ones that comes to mind. If my community needs a Christian, it humbles me. Some of the coaches that coach Riley and Carter, they call me preacher. And I have to remember that sometimes when the umpire don't have a clue. And he'd have a better shot of flipping a quarter, getting the call right. I have to remember that sometimes because they know I'm a preacher. But more than that, they ought to know we're a Christian. What does it really mean? Being a Christian means our Christian life is observed by the world. It means that it's opposite of the world. And we need to understand that if we're ever going to be a real Christian, our life's going to be offensive to the world. And that don't mean that we set out to have a bad spirit. You don't have to be. I'll be honest, if, I, if I'm going to be offensive, I don't want it to be because i got a bad spirit. I want it to be because I'm trying to live right. So maybe you'd meet me in the altar tonight and just say, Lord, I want to be a real Christian. I don't know, Brother Lyman, I'll never know if I've got, what, if I've got in me what Paul had in him until I'm put to that test. But all I can do, try to do the best I can and hope if I ever get put in that place, that God's grace will be sufficient. And Miss Pat, the reality is if I live a full life like you and Brother Roger have, that day may very well come. God help me to be a real Christian. Let's stand. Did you then sing it? You mind the Lord. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it.
crimson stain he washed it white as snow for nothing good have i whereby thy grace to claim i'll wash my garment white in the blood sing that chorus with her land. sing it now Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Well, praise God for his help. Praise the Lord for the good day. Appreciate you being here. We know we got several of our preachers. Uh, talked with Brother Mark this afternoon, said they had a, a good service up in Clayton this morning, and, and uh, Brother Colby over at uh, Mud Creek, and then Brother Scottie's preaching tonight over in Dawson County, Brother Levi's preaching at Canaan tonight. I appreciate the Lord giving our fellows opportunities to preach, and you pray for them, and God will help them, and uh, pray for Brother Martin, and they're on their way to Texas, be out there for several days, a week, week and a half, so pray for God to give them traveling mercies on the way out. Be back 730, you that drive your bus, you see Brother Richard got any questions, he'll let you know what you need to do. Uh, Wednesday night, 730, Brother David will have all the kids out in the main sanctuary over there. Um, Brother Gene, Miss, Miss Amy, you want to let them do the little guys, the little ones? Brother Gene, y'all, will that be all right? You and Miss Amy have the least, the little guys like you have. They'll have a class for the little guys downstairs, and uh, then we'll have Bible study in here. 730, you want to teachers enjoy it just a couple of weeks, and it'll be a want season again. So God bless you. Shake hands with your neighbor. You're at liberty.